But you know, as I was driving to, to church this morning, we went up by the university, we were going to pick up somebody, and then when we got to there to pick them up, I took up my phone, and I realized they sent me a text message this morning that says, don't pick me up, but we were already in front of their house, but that didn't, that's not important. So we, we went from there, and we went to, um, uh, we drove towards 109th Street to come to the church, right, and as I go by 109th Street, on 109th Street there's Runner's World. Anybody know that I've been there? I've been to that store a few times. And they tell me how I walk wrong and, and stuff like that. And so they give me special shoes. I don't know if they're just trying to sell me special or special shoes or whatever. But they, anyways, um, I, I they get, tell me what shoes to buy. And of course, they're, they're not very cheap. But but this morning, as we're driving by, I realize there's disciples of that uh, are not necessarily disciples of God or disciples of Jesus Christ in the world. There's disciples of hell. I've never seen so many people gathered around a store and going out for runs. In my life, I don't think I've ever seen that. The only place I've, I've seen that is in the military, and you don't have a choice when you're in the military. You go and you run. You know, in the military, they tell you get up in the morning at uh, an ungodly hour before uh, it's light out, and they say go. You're going for a run, and that means not necessarily just a little run, like around the block. They're talking about three or four kilometers, or five or six or seven, and up to ten kilometers. You're out there in the morning running. Now, these people are out getting ready to run, and not only is it cold out, and not only is it the earliest Sunday in the week, you know, the, the, our clocks are screwed up, they're out there, religiously out there, ready, getting ready to run. So in this world, there's lots of disciples out there, of different things. These ones are called disciples of health, or disciples of running. And in some ways, it's like worshipping another God, isn't it? Um, there's disciples, as we were talking, coming to work, or coming to work, Coming to church this morning. See, I'm still on my clock. It's still not caught up either. Um, as you're coming to church this morning, talk about other disciples. There's the disciples of the environment. You know, we want to be. You know, it's like health. We want to be healthy, right? We want to be like disciples of uh, uh, in, in the environment. We want to care for the environment. But I'm going to say there's disciples of the environment as well. There's disciples of fashion. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones that we came up with this morning as we we're driving along. There's disciples, all kinds of disciples out there, different things. And what is, what is a disciple? A disciple is somebody that follows an, a group or follows an idea or follows an individual and wants to become like them, to copy them, to be like them. So if you go to Runner's World, it's interesting, you know, in the morning, my sister actually went with, with the Runner's World. And, run, and um, she, they, they taught her how to run. So they taught her how to, to be an effective runner. So eventually, you know, they start off, you run for a, for a minute, you walk for a minute. You run for a minute, you walk for a minute. You, and then it gets, you run for a minute and a half, and you walk for, uh, you know, 30 seconds. And then, you, you know, they slowly get you up to the so when you're running for a long period of time. And then, so that you can be a real runner, a great runner. Maybe you can run a 5K race, or maybe you can run that 10K, or maybe you run that, eventually run that half marathon or the marathon, whatever. That's not going to happen in this world for me, but you know, there's people out there that are, are religiously going on, on every week. I mean, they, for some reason, um, I believe it's probably Runner's World too, but they run by our house every weekend. On Saturday morning, if I get up early, or Sunday morning, they're running by our house in teams of people and stuff. So they're, they're disciples. This morning I want to talk to us about being disciples, becoming like Jesus. You know, I've for a long time desired to become more of a disciple of Jesus Christ. My, that's my hope, my desire. I want to be like Jesus. You know, that, remember that old uh, sort of catchy phrase of like WWJD, right? It's wear them on a wrist, on wristband and stuff like that. What would Jesus do? We ask ourselves those kind of things and, and, and that's really what it's, what it's talking about is becoming a disciple. Asking ourselves, what would Jesus do in this, in this situation? What would Jesus do in that situation? How would he want me to live my life in this, in this uh, in situation or whatever? In many circles, though, the highest form of flattery is imitating a person, isn't it? You know, I want to be like Mike. You know, I remember that commercial too. And who do they call out? Michael Jordan. You know, I want to be like Mike. I want to run and jump. And I want to slam dunk and so forth, but the reality is that 95% of us in the world will never slam dunk a ball without a trampoline to jump on first. Or the, the, they lower the hoop down to the, to, to, the, to the grade one level, or something like that. You know, the, the gyms in the, in the elementary school, they lower 
hurdles down a little bit just so that the kids can hit the, the, hit the, the baskets. Well, the, low, the highest, so the high, one of the flattery is one of those important things if, if you want to follow somebody, be like somebody. Is that mine? I don't have it with me, right? I just heard somebody's uh, iPod or something tell them that they got, got something. So, um, but I believe the life of the believer, the greatest form of discipleship then, is becoming like Jesus, imitating Christ, becoming like Him, acting like Him, thinking like Him, walking like Him. Is it even possible though? I would say it's highly unlikely that we can ever get to the point that we're perfect. Anybody feel like they've got perfection down? You know, I, I got into the car this morning, I thought my hair was looking pretty good, and Ardell says to me, uh, did you mean to do that to your hair? And so I had to look in the mirror, and obviously, I didn't mean to do that this morning. It was, I don't even know how it got like that. I, I, I look in the mirror, and it's, it's standing up straight in the front. It's like, I don't know. You know, it's, it, it's not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. When we look in the mirror in our lives, we never going to be that perfect specimen, that perfect Christian. But does that mean we stop striving or trying? No, I don't believe so. We want to continue to try. We want to continue to strive to, do, to improve in our lives. We want to continue to, to be that better disciple, that one who, who, is, who improves and who grows and who continues to, to uh, move forward in their walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. My hope would be that I would reach far beyond where I am so that I might find the place God would have me be. It's, it's so, it's so uh, easy, though, to quit, though, isn't it? Which we see many have done, and there's times I would have to concede that I have stopped in my growth, and I take a period of time that I just seem to just say, I don't know, I, don't, I just can't seem to get it. But would it be better, not be better, rather, to move deeper in our relationship with Jesus than to stay as babies in Christ? Paul tells, as you see throughout his letters to the different churches, that's his challenge. Grow. Don't stay that babies, that like babies in Christ. Move forward. Don't be happy with where you're at. Strive for greater things. In the uh, church council reading book, Unlimiting God. In Unlimiting God, it, it helps us to see we need to not limit God in what we're trying, what, what we can do, with what we can do only. We need to surrender to Him. We need to be obedient to Him and follow Him. Well, in this passage of Scripture that we read earlier this morning, in Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14, I, I kind of got a picture as I was reading this, how we can strive to do that. Well, verse 11, it says, Besides this, knowing that, knowing the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. Now, isn't that an interesting passage for this morning? As we think about our, our desire for more sleep today. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. We need to be aware of what's happening around us. So many people like to, people walk around like they have their eyes shut, they act like Nothing is happening in the world around them. They, they need to see the importance of spreading the good news. Uh, the importance of, of, of letting people know there's, there's hope out there. There's salvation out there. We need to stop having a blind eye to the world around us. You know, it's easy to, to just, just to, to say, just to keep having, you know, drive down the street basically like a horse with blinders on. You know, we don't want to see anything. I don't, you know, everything's perfect. Or we put on those glasses, those, as they say, rose-colored glasses, and we, we look around and say, oh, everything is just fine, it's damn and good. But there's a world around us that needs our, our love, our care. A world around us that needs us to reach out to them and say that someone loves them. A world around us that, that uh, needs to know that, that, that uh, salvation is near. You know, I was, I was watching a, a video clip when we were at the follow-up <coughs> sessions for Billy Graham. And in that video clip, we see um, this girl looks, I don't know what the great term is, but looks to me like goth or, you know, or one of those people that, you know, that wears the dark makeup and the uh, very pale looking uh, foundation, I guess it's called Raider Dell or whatever. They make themselves look very ill. But she 
sitting there and she's going, first thing she says is, how long? How long are you going to wait? And you think, what is she talking about? And then she says, how long are you going to wait to tell me that Jesus loves me? And just like, my heart is sunk. Because I often see those people. I'm, I'm a people watcher. Anybody a people watcher here? I love Sydney. I love, you know, our Del goes shopping, our girls go shopping, and I go with them. And I hate shopping. I'm not really a shopping fan. Yesterday, um, unfortunately, Ryan and I had to go shopping with them as they looked for different things for the wedding and stuff like that. And, it, and eventually, it was like, are we ready to go yet? Are we ready to go yet? Are we ready to go yet? And Michael is not necessarily a great place for people watching. There's nowhere to sit down and just look at people. But the mall is great. Because so I go to the mall, and I'll just, Ardell will go to the store, and I just sit down, and I just watch people. And then you see another one, you go, who dressed them this morning? You know, or, you, you, you just, you're amazed. And then I realized, I watched this video, and I go, oh, I'm not seeing them for what they can be, I'm seeing them for what they have been, for what they are. I'm not seeing the potential of how Jesus can change your lives and what would happen if Jesus came into your lives. I'm seeing them as people that just don't like me or just are weird. You know, I, I, I have to be honest, when I was, I don't look like it now necessarily, but when I was in high school, I was a, a jaw. And I know that that doesn't, that, that may, you may go, yeah, right. But really I was, right, Adele? I mean, stand up for me. Just, <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> yeah, you know, at one time I was really in the, in the spring we played football. I mean, in the fall we played football, in the spring we played rugby. So you know, I, I was pretty active, and and we kind of made fun of all these people. And, and you know, I, I realized I looked back then too, and I think how weird sighted I was, how asleep I was. I didn't see that these people had potential. I only saw these guys in the 1980s wearing makeup. I'm thinking, you've lost your mind. What they really is, they've lost their hope. We need to wake up and see the world around us and realize that, that we can't be asleep. We can't close our eyes to it. We can't, we can't look and go downtown and just look at the stores and window shop and, and go shopping in the great stores downtown, we have to realize that there's people out there that are on the street, that are homeless, that are without hope. And how can they know that there's hope if we don't tell them? How can they know there's hope if we don't reach our hand out to them? You know, the Bible tells us in James, he says, you can't just say, oh, oh I, I, hear your, I see your problem, I'll pray for you. Basically, I'm going to give my interpretation in chapter 2. We have to actually, we can't do, I mean, that, that's wrong, it tells us. We need to be willing to go and, to, and to share the love of Jesus Christ with all of us. How will they know if we don't wait? Then we go on to verse 12, and it says in verse 12, The night is nearly over, the daylight is near, so let, let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Satan has a desire, really, to crush you so that you, so we need to get ready for battle. If you go into battle, if you go into, into conflict, you know, when we send our troops to Afghanistan, we want them in the right uniforms, we want them with the right protection, and, and, and so forth. As Christians, as we go out, we need to be prepared. We need to get on the armor of God. We need to go and get prepared. If we want to understand that deeper, we go into Ephesians chapter 6, Verses 10 through 18, where it tells us that we need to put on the full armor of God. How we need to put on the breastplate, breastplate of righteousness. We need to take the, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the word, and so forth. We need to get ready. We need to prepare ourselves in order for, for us to be able to meet the challenge. Jesus was always ready for whatever the world threw at him, wasn't it? It doesn't matter if it was the religious leaders or Satan in the, in the wilderness. It was, it was for the frailness of, of men. Or the weakness of the disciples. 
or the, or the sickness of those around him. He was willing and ready to stand up and he was prepared. Why? Because he knew what God's word said and he understood how God worked. And how do we do that? Well, we don't do that only by coming on Sunday mornings and listening to, to the message. We don't do that only by coming on Sunday mornings and, and sitting in a Sunday school class. We do that by being sure we understand what God's Word is telling us, so we take time and spend time in His Word on a daily basis. We spend time in prayer and preparing us spiritually, so as we meet those in, on the street, as we meet those at work, as we meet our friends and family, we're able to say to them, yes, we have a God who cares for us. You know, sometimes we, we say we fail, we struggle, we, we, we falter, we, we get caught up in sin. And why is that? I can tell you that the times that I mess up, the times that I fail, the times that I struggle, are the times that I haven't spent my time with God. I got up, and I just go straight into the car. Actually, go to, first I go jump in the shower, and then I get in the car, and I, you know, I give myself 15 minutes, and I get to the church, and by the, after I dropped off Maddie, and I, you know, and I'm just, I'm not prepared myself to meet the challenges of the day. I haven't put on the armor that God has prepared. It would not be great that every day when we meet the challenges, the frustrations of school, or work, or family, or friends, that we were able to handle it because better, because we were walking closer with our, our, our God. And we put on the armor of life. Then we go on to verse 13. And we see here we don't need to get caught up in the attractions of the world. In verse 13 it says, Let us walk with, with decency as in, the, as in the daylight, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity or promiscuity, not in quarreling or jealousy. Now I think this is an interesting passage of Scripture. Why? Because, because they, it doesn't, you know, we, it picks on the first, the first few things there. We go, yeah, look at those drunks. Or, or look at those people there out there being prom, uh, promiscuous or or look at actings in, 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 in impurities, in sexual impurities, and then it goes on and says jealousy and quarrels, quarreling. Do we ever charge? Are we ever jealous? Do we ever quarrel? Do we ever covet? You know what I mean by covet? You know, like you know, somebody see that guy drive down the car with a, uh, down the street with that nice car and we're driving in our, our minivan. I'm not a, I, I, I thought I was a way past minivan until the last couple of years and even one needed a car, and that's what I God gave us. But it's so easy to get caught up in those things, isn't it? Jealousy, quarrel, and so forth. We need to be sure that we don't get stuck in that. And it's interesting here, it uses an interesting analogy in this section of Scripture. It talks about being in the daylight. What does that mean? So we, we're, we're not hiding in the darkness, we're not in the shadows, we're not, you know, uh, uh, behind the scenes, we're not uh, stabbing in the back, we're not walking in the, in the, in the in, uh, behind people to, to hurt them or anything like that. We're up front, we're in the daylight, we're, we're honest with each other. We show integrity with one another. We're not to be fooled by the world's lures. Like fishing lure, where you know they, they look pretty, but when it comes down to it, when the fish bites on it, it's, it's not pretty, is it? That's what the things in this world are like. As they get cast out in front of us, they look pretty, they look innocent, and then we get caught and take that bite, and we get a mouthful. Oh, and then he just 
sets that hook, and he starts really in the end, and you're fighting, and then, you're, and then eventually you just give up. You've been caught. But you need to say that way. The great thing is that God is walking beside us. He's desiring to help us. And I hope that. It's not going to be easy. I'm going to tell you that sometimes sin in our lives, it hurts. And to get, a, get that hook out of our mouth, it hurts. But the relief we have when we follow Christ. We become like Him. What a difference that would make. And then as we go on, as we continue along here in this section of Scripture, we go to verse 14. And the need in this passage, I really think it's how we need to decide what really, what really is our goal. He says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the flesh of desire. When it comes down to it, we need to decide what is important for us, right? Sure, we make mistakes, as like you said. Sure, we struggle. Sure, we have all those different things that go on in our life. But in the end, we must decide who will follow. In Joshua chapter 24, verses 21 to 24, and verse 15, rather, the Joshua challenges the people and the people respond in verse 21 through 24 of Joshua. Joshua says to them, as for, you know, who you need to decide for yourself, who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And then down in verse 21 through 24, he goes on and he says, Yeah, and the people said, Yeah, we're going to follow God. We're going to, we're going to trust Him in Him. Will we serve flesh? Will we serve the world will we, or self? Or will we serve God? question we must ask ourselves. Will we put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Will we be clothed in Him? Will we follow Him? Will we become like Him? Will we imitate Him? Or will we imitate the world? Trust in the world. This verse, this verse 14 tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us to that, that we're supposed to be like Him. The only other time that this sort of analogy is used is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, but it, it means that we identify with him in his death on the cross, in his burial, and in a borrowed tomb, and in his glorious resurrection. It's similar to how we dress ourselves in certain clothes to express how we want people to think of us. We want to be preppy, we want to be a jock, we want to be goth, or emo, or, is that emo right? Is that the right word? Emo? I, I don't understand. I used to just think emu, and then I'm not going to straighten me out. It's not emu. Emu is a bird, right? But it doesn't really fly. But it's a big bird. But emo. Or whatever style we might have. I mean, there's, these are, that's more for my time, I guess. But, you know, you go around and you, you, you see people identify themselves by what they wear. Isn't it true? Thus, we should put on Jesus Christ. We need to be, people need to be able to identify who we are in a similar way. We are to be clothed in Christ, which is to be in outward expression of who we are as believers. We can't just be believers on the inside. Who we are as Christians needs to be expressed on the outside as well. So in James, what did he tell us? Be doers of the word. In other words, we can't just be have faith. We have to be expressing our faith through actions. Through helping the poor. Through helping the poor. Through helping the widow. Through helping those in need in our church. Through helping our brother and our sister. Through helping our neighbor, even that neighbor who just seems to be miserable all the time. Anybody have a neighbor like that? I, we, I, I, it's hard. We have neighbors that it's hard to just seem to get to know them. And then we have one strange neighbor that I just don't understand sometimes. It's the church across the street. You know, we get, you know it's, it's, it's strange, but we need to express the love of Jesus Christ to all those around us. It cannot be kept as a secret. And the best way to be clothed in Christ is not to be caught up in, the, in what the world tells us is good and right, but rather to live a life holy and righteous before God. So what is holy to be separated for God? This means that we love people regardless of their walk of life they come from. We love the Lord our God, and we love the Lord our God with our whole being. You and I need not to be afraid of identifying, being identified as Christians. I remember when I was a teenager, there was a time that I would go and I'd say, oh, I'm a man of those Christian guys. We used to 
call it, what is it, ICSF or, inter or ISCF or Interschool Christian Fellowship? I don't know if you guys have that stuff anymore. But it's like, oh, I'm hanging with those guys. Those guys are a little different. But I was afraid. And I think, you know, we need not be afraid of our faith. I know many of us struggle at times to do this, but it really becomes, to become a disciple of Jesus, we need to stand up and tell the world who we belong to. We need to identify with him. It may be, mean that we need to follow him in baptism. Maybe we need to follow him in the right thing to do at work. Maybe we need to, to be the good Samaritan or go to the one who needs uh, to hear from somebody else because nobody else will. I'm not sure what you mean to do, but we must put on the guard that says we are believers. You know, maybe you need to, to connect with someone like Stephen at your back and go to the whole, or not the whole mission to uh, Mustard Seed Church. Sorry, I couldn't think of the name of the phone. Or maybe you need to identify with, or go with someone like Nathan and, and uh, Grace. Anita, who went and handed out hats and tubes, or tubes and scarves, rather, and things like that, to those who have nothing, or blankets, the whole mission, for those who are on the street, the forgotten. But you know, those aren't the only ones that are forgotten. You go to your, 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 your high school classroom, your junior high school classroom, or your university classroom, or your workplace. There's people that are walking beside you that are so lonely. So lost. They need to know what someone cares. And it may not be popular. line